the same exact arrangement. And I played it for Billy. He says, how did they get that? And at that time, I was collecting stock arrangements. And I showed up with this. He says, I've never seen this before. So that was the story. And he finally got the score back. But so that's my little jealous uh, sugar story. That's a good one. Um, the, uh, let's talk about the Trumbauer recordings for, uh, for a minute, because uh, Chalice was involved in those. And I mean, I kind of think that, that that's more along the lines of the stuff that the Gold Cat Band might have recorded if, if they'd been left in their own devices. But now my concept is that a lot of the things, like singing the blues, clarinet marmalade, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm coming Virginia, I'm not sure, but, but uh, were worked out, you know, in the St. Louis period, Detroit period, you know, when, when uh, uh, Trump I was leading a small contingent that, uh, you know, playing every night, but, that, but that, that's when those things evolve. Um, but on the other hand, we know that Chalice was uh, involved because there's that uh, quote that's in the Sudhalter Evans book where he talks about how Bix came over, this is for the ostrich walk arrangement, and, and played the individual parts on the piano for him, and he notated them. Um, do you know anything about those those sessions or the arranging that was done for them or how that happened? Not not really a lot, but but Bill mentioned many times that it was great having Bix as a friend because of course Bix was a great guy and an unbelievable improviser on the trumpet, but a very free spirit and and, and very uh, excited person to be around. Uh, exciting person to be around us musically. Bix was always at the piano composing, and, and he, would, he would come over and, and play stuff on the piano and say, Big, uh, Bill, listen to this. And he said, wow, that's fantastic. He said, having Bix around, they just had this amazing fountain of ideas that were just flowing out of this guy, and I couldn't capture them, and Bix was more than happy to, to share this with him, you know, just go ahead and use it. And, um, yeah, I'm sure the uh, the ostrich walk was probably another uh, number that could have been recorded by Goldkett, and unfortunately, you know, just didn't didn't uh, see the light of day. Uh -huh. um, and I, I mentioned this before, but you know, I, when I was in college, uh, I was lucky enough to do. I just got called to do a, a job with Buddy Morrow, and at that time, they just they didn't have traveling bands. But he would. I went to Indiana University, and this was in. Columbus, Ohio, or something. It was Cincinnati. It was in Cincinnati, and uh, just showed up, and everybody meets on the bandstand, puts on their, I mean, you know, behind you put on your jacket, so you all look like you're from the same band. But nobody, <laughs> nobody knew anybody else. At any rate, Bill Rank was was there. Was the trauma player. The one time I met him, you, you probably met him a few times, right? I, I had the fortunate uh, to, to, to play with him and, and uh, him and Spiegel with their with their original megaphones yeah. with Chauncey and at the was it was that the, the, the Carnegie Hall thing yeah. Yeah, that the Dick yeah. Subholder put together yeah, I, saw, I saw that concert yeah. Yeah. From, it was great yeah Joe Venuti was there at Doc Riker Chauncey uh, Morehouse Chauncey Morehouse yeah it was fantastic it was in that uh, when was that like about 75 <laughs> or something yeah the New York Chance Repertory Company yeah and that was great it was a great concert and that at that time you could still Phil Carnegie Hall, which is about uh, 3,000 plus for a big spider band concert, you know, in New York. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, oh yeah, so at any rate, I did this job with Bill Rank, and he was as sweet as could be and everything. But I asked him about the Bix and his gang recordings. I said, you know, who wrote, because you don't think of Bix as being an arranger or, you know, even, you know, the kind of guy that would really plan ahead for a record section, session and all that. But, I, but apparently it was, totally organized for these things and, and actually and he confirmed that Bix composed and arranged and wrote out the introductions and endings and, and things on the Bix and his gang recordings. Um, now I, I remember reading somewhere, I was wondering if you heard this, that the, you know for instance the, the introduction to Sam, yeah. that that was Bix's that Chalice notated, did you ever hear that or you think that's no. just Chalice's? I, I don't know, I, you know, you know, you know, I don't know but it, it could be and, and you're, when we Played with Josh, you know, and you illustrate all those in, uh, intros and codas that are so. I never thought of it that way, but that's pure by the back. Oh I mean, yeah, it's so it's beautiful a, and so so ahead of its time. I mean, he does a lot of things that became standard practice ten and twenty years later, but uh, very very far ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, 
So, okay, now let's talk a little bit about uh, the Whiteman period. Now, Whiteman, of course, was the most uh, popular and uh, wealthy, best, highest paid, highest paying. And in fact, from those Victor contracts that, that, that Vince, Vince has a little stash of, you can see. I Xerox them. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can see, uh, you know, I mean, it's fascinating because you can see what people were paid for recording sessions. You know, usually the, this paper trail is all gone. But you can see, you know, generally people were paid about $200 for the whole band for a tune, per tune. And it didn't matter if it was a 12-piece band or 10-piece band or whatever, but that was the kind of standard for acceptable take that would be released. Um, but Whiteman had, from going back, because he was such a huge success from his original contracts, he had guarantees, yearly guarantees, which other band leaders didn't have, yeah. of like, what, $75,000, $150,000 yeah. a year, right? Yeah. And he paid his men more than anyone else. I think he, Bill said that Fifty dollars per side that, that that they got, and that was almost double scale from all the other musicians. Uh, normal scale was twenty-five bucks per man, and if you worked for Sam Lennon, he gave you twenty-three fifty. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I I, I I I talked to Andre Whiteman. It looks like Henry Andre Whiteman, and he played with the Ben Sullivan band, and uh, I'm sorry, not Ben Sullivan, uh, Sam Lennon, and one time got in a dispute with him. And he stood up in the recording session. He says, "This is all you're going to get out of me for twenty-three fifty. You know, <laughs> and all the guys were amazed that he said that. He, said, he still hired me, but Whiteman really took care of his guys because he was able to get the money, and he made a lot of money for the Victor label. And when you read about his his travels in the Don Reno book, he shows up in the here in the Midwest, and there's just thousands and thousands of people, and his police escorts, and he's given the key to the city, and uh, Radio broadcast. He was an amazing phenomenon. Right. And, and interestingly enough, if you read uh, Duke Ellington's book, uh, "Music Is My Mistress," he's got a second little section on Paul Eichner. It's very complimentary, uh, you know. But I think a lot of band leaders felt that Paul Whiteman kind of raised the status of musicians and popular music uh, across the board for everybody, and, then, and then the, the tendency was to be thankful for him for that. You know, now you read all these uh, kind of revisionist jazz histories where they just go, you know, white, but you know, it's just like a dirty word. But hopefully we'll get past that. I hope so. I'll keep, I'll keep punching. <laughs> Um, but, you know, Whiteman, of course, had more money to hire arrangers, and he hired them uh, from within the band and outside the band. Do you know how much he paid for arrangements? Uh, no, you know, I don't remember Bill telling me that. Right. I mean, but Bill was on a weekly salary. His name is on that payroll sheet. That oh, that's right. been, uh, and he was getting about as much as the other guys in the band, I yeah. think, right? Yeah, Ferdy Grofe got more. Right, he did more than for some of Yeah, that wonderful whitening payroll sheet. Right. You can see that uh, Grofe's got the biggest piece of the change there. And, and, uh, um, I'm just wondering, do you have any idea how many arrangements Chalice was expected to turn out in a given period, of like a week? Or was it you just assigned? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> having all those guys there, you know, having uh, Manny Milnick uh, doing arrangements, and, and uh, later Roy Bargay and Chalice, and uh, Tom Satterfield. So you had a lot of arrangers in there, you know, and to uh, divvy up the work. Let, let, let me ask you this before I forget. Um, you know, on the Gold Kid records and the Whiteman records, you hear those three trumpet passages with Bix playing the lead, and it sounds like a harmonized solo of Bix. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Chalice ever tell you about how those came about? Or did, what's your. Well, I think working at the piano, you know, with, with Bix. Uh -huh. um, he didn't play the cornet and annotate it that way. They, they figured everything out on the piano. Bill was a very. Um, Amateur pianist, he, he was very slow but and methodical and all that stuff. And he says Bix was a much faster because Bix was more a, a player. He had played the piano, and, and Bill was really a saxophonist, but played a little bit of the piano. But they would work things out and figure out where to put the notes and things like that from from their afternoon sessions. Okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Oh, also, it seems like.